Oh, hello, hello, awesome. Yeah, most of you guys know me as Shua, not Joshua, so I'm sorry if that was confusing when you were signing up for chapel, you're not getting who you thought. Um, uh, let's uh, actually just jump right into the scripture. Um, we're going to be reading from 1 Peter 4, uh, verses 1 through 11, and it says, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in sin, whoever suffers in the body is done with sin, and as a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached, even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. Verse 7 says, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober minds so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you so much for who you are. God, we thank you that you're here with us today, and we thank you for uh, these words that you've given us. And I pray that we would be good hearers and better doers of these words. And we ask all this in your name. Amen. Amen. So, um, the other day, I was actually reflecting on, a, on freshman year, and I know like there's probably not a lot of freshmen here, because they're uh, supposed to be in UCOR, um, but, <laughs> um, so the other day, like, me and my friends, we actually went to the pumpkin patch, and you can throw up this first picture. This, so this is my friends and I, actually two years ago, our freshman year, <laughs> you can go to the next slide. And this is us two years later. Uh, We lost one, but the four of us are actually rooming together this year. Um, And I was just thinking, like, freshman year, it kind of just hit different. Like, I was on Wolfpack, um, and we kind of won Screaming Eagles Week. And it was just like, there's always something going on every night. It was just like, it was so fun. Um, But when I came into into college as this freshman, I was probably like the scrawniest, like you saw in that first picture, I was like the scrawniest, like skinniest, smallest kid, like (laughs) I weighed absolutely nothing, like I was in no way like ready for college, Um, I weighed nothing, I basically had like zero muscle, and so like naturally these, these friends that I was talking about, they're oh so gracious, and we're like, dude, (laughs) like you gotta get in the gym, like you have got to get in the gym. And so I like pretty hesitantly complied thinking like, all right, I'll go work out once or twice and they'll get off my back. But um, that first week of working out was probably like one of the most painful, <laughs> like horrible, terrible experiences. Uh, like the first day we, we worked out arms and my girlfriend, Joe, she can attest to this. Like I was literally just like stuck like this, like walking around my arms, like, I could not stretch them. So she, like, she would legit have to grab my hand and, like, stretch them out because they were so tight. And I was just, like, so incredibly sore. <laughs> and uh, we'd do, like, leg day, and, like, I couldn't walk for, like, a week. And it was, it was terrible, just absolutely terrible. Um, but I flashed forward, like, a couple years. Um, we've been working out, and, like, one of my favorite things to do. Um, like, made a lot of progress, like, completely, like, changed, like, my, my perspective on it. And... Um, I think it's easy to feel really good about that progress and like I'm finally where I want to be. But then like because of that, I think it's really easy that we get, we get super complacent, right? We're like, I'm exactly where I need to be. I don't need to do anymore. I accomplished my goal. Like for me, I was like, I gained the weight. I drank all the protein. Like I'm feeling good. I'm exactly where I need to be. Um, but I think when we do that, we actually run a lot of risks. Like for working out, for example, like I run the risk to my physical and mental health. 
I run the risk of losing all this progress that I've made. I run this risk of having to go through that suffering and that difficulty again because I've allowed myself to become complacent and apathetic towards my goals, right? Like, I already suffered enough. Like, I don't want to have to do any more. Like, this sucks. It's not fun, right? And I think a lot of us can relate to that, whether it be like schoolwork, right? I know I've been in that in that boat where I'm like, I already aced my first two exams. Like, I don't even need to take the third one, right? Like, I'm fine. You know, our, my class, my grades are great. Like, they're where they need to be. Like, I don't need to keep trying. And I become complacent, and I start to lose that. Um, or I look at, like, there's a lot of musicians here uh, at Northwest. That, like, I'm a drummer, and so I know when I go through, like, seasons of, like, not practicing, like, taking a break, taking a rest, like, I start to lose some of that skill. I start to lose what I worked so hard to, to build. And I think, <clears throat> and I think it's, like, easy. Like, once we reach a goal, to simply just start coasting, right? And I think we as a faith community tend to do this far, far too often. And I think that we're actually really similar to this audience that Peter is dealing with. He's saying that we've spent enough time doing these like evil things. We've spent enough time in sin. Um, we've invested enough time there, right? We, and instead, like Christ, he suffered in the body, so we're able to arm ourselves with that same attitude. Um, and we don't, we don't want our suffering to be in vain by allowing ourselves as a church community to get off track. And I think Peter is warning these followers of Jesus that are a lot like us to not allow yourself to get off track. And I know that like in my spiritual life, I've been there. Like even now, this is something like, I struggle with. Like I went to church the other day. Like I, I drummed on worship team. I served. Like I said a nice thing. I, was, I encouraged one person. Like, I deserve this break. Like, I deserve to just, like, let down. Like, I don't have to spend time with God. Like, I deserve that break. But I think that's exactly <laughs> what Peter is warning us not to do here. And so my question is, like, what are some of the things that allow us to get off track, right? What is it that leads us back to these sinful habits? What is it that keeps us from our willingness to suffer, I know for me, like, something that happens a lot is I just, like, lose my sense of urgency, right? I think of my spiritual life. It's like, all right, I'm just, you know, going through the motions. I'm doing my thing. I'll go to church. I'll do what I need to do. But, like, ultimately, it's God transforming me. It's all God. He's going he's gonna to make me into the man that I'm supposed to be. He's, like, it's all on God, right? And I, it requires no action on my part. Or sometimes I feel like... I work really hard on my spiritual life, but nothing happens, and so I allow myself to become apathetic or uncaring. And I think a lot of us can relate to those situations. I think some of us, maybe, maybe you're losing your patience with your spiritual life. Maybe you're just frustrated, like you're not there yet, right? You're not where you want to be. And it feels like you've worked so hard, right? You've worked so hard, but you're not the people you think you, you're not the person you think you should be, or you're not where you think you should be. And I know that, like, I've felt that a lot. Like, my Enneagram 3 dies a little bit when I, like, <laughs> work really hard and, like, spend all this time, like, investing, and, like, I see no results, right? I see no results. And, like, for Enneagram 3s, like, they're driven by results, accomplishments. And so that's, like, hard for me. And I think that some of you feel the same way. And I think maybe there's some of us on the other end that, like, you haven't quite made that commitment to follow to follow Christ. You're not, like, you haven't quite gotten over that hump. And I'm, and I'm wondering, like, what, what's keeping you back? Is it, it might be intimidating. Maybe it's a little daunting. Maybe you feel like, no, like, that's too much to ask, right? It's too much to ask of me to leave the life I'm living. And, like, maybe you're scared. Like, you're, you know, you're scared to give it up. But, like, my encouragement to you is, like, you're not alone in that. And I think that every single one of us has this tendency to get off track. Every single one of us loses focus at one point or another. And I think we've all experienced complacency and apathy where, where you feel satisfied and so you don't need to do anymore. Or you feel, like, just uncaring, that uncaring mentality. Similar to, like, that, that gym analogy. Like, I've reached my peak form and I just don't want to suffer anymore. Like, I don't want to push myself, right? Because I've, you know, I look like I work out. You know, why do I need to work out if you look like you work out, right? And I think, <laughs> I think also, like, it happens with our relationships. I think we get, we, we get comfortable with someone, and so we stop pouring into that relationship. Like, 
you know, I've worked hard and, and we have that mentality like, oh, they're going to be around for a long time. Like, they'll be around forever, right? And so you stop working towards that relationship. You become complacent. I know that's happened with me. Like, freshman year, like, I had a ton of friends. Like, I had so many friends. Like, it was just crazy. Like, we were living this, this crazy fun life. And I was just thinking like, ah, oh, like, these 20 people are going to be lifelong friends. And it doesn't work like that. You don't, like, you if you don't pour out into these relationships, you don't invest, you know, they're going to fizzle out. And I think at one moment, like, we're right where we want to be. We're right where we want to be spiritually. And the next moment, we're asking ourselves, like, how did I get here, <laughs> right? Like, how am I in this dark place? Like, how did I really allow myself to get to this, this point? And I think that's a huge danger to our spiritual life. Because complacency and apathy, they don't, like... They just like, they, they happen, right? And you don't notice it. You don't notice that they're happening, but they are. And we end up in these dark, dangerous places that we swore, that'll never be me. Like you see someone in a dark place, and you're like, that'll never be me. I'll never go to that place. Or we end up lonely when we thought we had so many friends, right? And I think that, that some of us, maybe you're in that place right now. And you just feel like, I can't get out of this dark place. I'm never gonna escape that pit. I'm never, ever gonna get over that hump. And on the other side, maybe there's some of us that are in a great spot right now, right? You're in a great spot spiritually, emotionally, mentally. But I want you to know, like, you're going to have temptations to become apathetic, to become uncaring. There's going to be days where you struggle to stay on track, right? But what, what is it that's going to help us with the temptation to be apathetic? What's going to get us out of that pit? And I think something we really need to realize is, like, Becoming complacent and apathetic, it doesn't just happen in one big moment, right? It happens in the smaller, more subtle ways. I think more often than not, like, you're not going to lose your faith overnight. You're not going to lose all your friends overnight, right? And I think, like, take for example, I don't think a man cheats on his wife just randomly. Like, it's not just a random, like, ah, flip the switch, I'm going to go do that. No, it's the little decisions that lead there, right? It's the double take here and there. Or maybe it's the, the little flirtatious comments here and there. Or looking at that Instagram account here and there, right? And I think getting off track, it seems to happen in these smaller decisions. And so maybe staying on track also happens in the little decisions too, right? And I think Peter is giving the church a few small decisions that they can make each day to stay on track, right? Verse 1 it talks about like, therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with that same attitude because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. And verse four is like, they're surprised that you do not join them in their reckless wild living and they heap abuse on you. And I'm sure like a lot of us are asking like, okay, you're saying be like Christ. Like that's not exactly a, a small decision to make. Like, that's a, that's a big thing, especially because, like, we hear that a lot in church, right? Like, every, every Sunday, it's like, we need to be more like Christ. And you're like, well, duh. Like, I mean, I know that's the goal, but, like, what does that mean? What does that look like? And I think, like, we, even in our lives, like, we have those people. Um, like, I think a lot of you guys, you guys know Jono, like, Northwest, like, living legend Jono. And we see people like that who's just, like, He's so kind, he's funny, he's gracious, he's inclusive, he wants to be everybody's friend, everybody wants to be his friend, and we look at those people and we're like, that'll never be me, like, that could never, ever be me, and I think we treat that, that saying, be like Christ, the same way, we think like, that's impossible, and so I'm just going to disregard it, like, that, that could never be me, so I'm going to disregard it, and I think that Peter is actually saying like, we have to make a couple decisions. And so my first daily decision, if you can throw that up on the slides, it might be, yeah. So be willing to suffer. And I think that's a lot to ask sometimes. But we need to decide daily that we are willing to suffer for righteousness. And I think a lot of times, like, we mishandle the abuse and suffering that's heaped on us because we're not prepared. Simply put, we're not prepared. And, and Peter, speaking here, he knew all about that. He knew all about that, right? Jesus told Peter, you will deny me three times. And Peter brushed it off. Now, that'll, I would never, ever do that. Why would I deny you? Because he thought he was in this great place spiritually, but he wasn't actively working to prepare for that moment. And I think that he was complacent in his faith. He didn't think he needed anything else. 
And when it, ta- like when it actually came time to stand up for righteousness, Peter claimed that he did not know Jesus. He said, I never knew him. Who is that? I don't know Jesus. And I think that we do the same thing. For me, I like, I like to imagine those scenarios, even with like martyrs or like people that are like so quick to stand up for their faith and be like, yeah, that's gonna be me. If anyone says anything about my faith or anything about Jesus, I'm gonna stand up. Like that's gonna be so easy in that moment. But then like I see how I react in even like the smallest like tiny conflict or like smallest confrontation and I realize like, I'm not prepared for that moment. I'm not prepared to suffer for Christ. And that's why I think like it is a daily decision and a daily practice to go like, Lord, whatever comes today, whatever may come, I'm ready. I am prepared because you are with me and you go before me. And I think that we can trust Christ to answer this prayer because he knew suffering and he can relate to us in our suffering. My, uh, my fourth grade teacher, she'd always like, we, we had elementary chapel, I went to like a, a smallest private school ever, and we'd have this like elementary chapel, we'd have worship, um, and I remember me and all my like little fourth grade friends, we'd be like standing up during worship, like my legs hurt, like I want to sit down, like I'm tired, it's been like five minutes and I don't want to stand anymore, <laughs> right? And I think like my, my teacher, she would always be like, It's kind of savage and like a little bit hurtful. (laughs) But she'd always be like, if Jesus can die on a cross, I think that you can stand up for 10 more minutes. (laughs) And like, right, and that that example, it seems like way too extreme. Like looking back, it's like kind of extreme to tell a little fourth grader, like, you know, Jesus died on a cross, you can stand up, you'll be fine. But I think like sometimes we find our sufferings unbearable, right? We think like our sufferings are so unbearable to live with. But if we look in 1 Corinthians, it tells us that God is faithful, right? God is faithful. He's not going to give you more than you can bear. You're not going to be tried beyond what you are able to bear. Jesus understands our suffering. He understands what you're going through. And like, I want you to remember, like, there is nothing and no one more capable of relating to your struggle and relating to your suffering than Jesus. He gets it. He understands it. He knows your suffering. And I think like, if Jesus didn't get complacent, what right, what excuse do we have to get complacent, right? His suffering, I can guarantee you, is probably a little worse than yours, right? And so what right do we have to become complacent? Because even Christ, like, he suffered this terrible, excruciating death, but he did it to accomplish that goal. And I think like we need to realize that like true Christ-likeness, we really wanna be like Christ, that Christ-likeness, it's revealed in sacrifice. It's revealed in sacrifice. This willingness to suffer for Christ only commits us more firmly than ever to obedience and to relationship. And that helps us, because like as believers, as a church community, we need to be absolutely convinced convinced that it's better to do right and suffer than to do wrong and miss out on what God is doing. And I don't think anything is more convincing than the love of Jesus, the love that Jesus has for you. Nothing is more convincing than his new mercies, his new love, his new grace that's readily available to you, to each one of you. It's readily available each and every single day. And I think like Christ, he is lovingly and willingly gonna go through that storm with you. But so often, I think like as a church community, we allow ourselves to get distracted and complacent because we, we think like, all right, well, God has grace for me. I can take this break. I can relax, you know. I can take a week off from my, my devotions or a week off from my time spent with the Lord because God has grace for me, Right? Like, that's what this is all about. God's showing me grace. And we miss out on the action that God is calling us to. Maybe it's simply just showing kindness to, to someone who doesn't always return it to you. Maybe it's just doing the right thing when it costs you. Maybe it's encouraging someone that you maybe don't know super well and it's uncomfortable. There's so many of these small decisions, these small decisions that maybe, maybe it's gonna cause you temporary suffering for a little bit, But in the long run, that's going to lead to life, and that's going to lead to growth. 
I think one of the biggest things that like keeps us re- like from becoming like Christ and really gets us off track is this notion that we have time. I mentioned it earlier, like my perspective is like, I got time, like God's just doing stuff in me, I got time. And like I don't wanna be, or like we think like this idea that we're, we're satisfied enough, this complacency, we're satisfied enough to, to stop pursuing for a little bit because we, we don't think it'll affect our spiritual life. You know, if I take one day off from reading my Bible, that's not gonna affect my spiritual life. And then the next day, we say the same thing. And a week later, we say the same thing. And we find ourselves a month later in that pit that we just don't know how we got there. And I don't think we recognize the dangers that come up when we become complacent. And I think we run that risk of returning back to where we started. But Peter recognizes here in the text that they're not where they started. He recognizes that they've come out of their sinful lives. They've made progress. And I think a lot of us, especially at Northwest University, we're in that space today where, yeah, okay, we go to a Christian school, right? We're committed to our faith, but we're not actively and rhythmically pursuing Christ and who he's called us to be. And I think that, that's ultimately what leads us to the second daily decision, and that is that we need to live with urgency, Verses seven through, verse seven, it says like, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert, be of sober mind, love each other deeply, offer hospitality, be faithful stewards of the gifts that God's given you. And I'm like, I don't wanna be morbid, but like, we need to understand that like in an instance, this precious life that we live, it can be taken away. And I know that sucks to think about and it, maybe it causes anxiety and it's not, not a fun thought, but we need to realize that when it comes to our spiritual life. In an instance, our life could be taken away. And that's why I wanna encourage you guys that we need to start living with a sense of urgency. I don't think it's a coincidence that this first thing Peter says, the end of all things is near, therefore be alert so that you may pray. We gotta be on our knees in prayer as a church community especially right now, in the midst of COVID, in the midst of all this division, the election, all these scary things, prayer for our own suffering, prayer for these sufferings of the world that like, we're all going through, maybe prayer spent worshiping, prayer spent asking God, like, speak to me, guide me, because I don't think we can suffer without that guidance of God, without that grace of God, but we have to start somewhere. We cannot become complacent. Peter says to love each other deeply. And I think like where love abounds, like a lot of offenses are readily overlooked. They're readily forgiven where love abounds. And we cannot underestimate the power of love. Absolutely not. But we gotta remember that this is an urgent call to love. Right now in this world of brokenness, the division, the frustration, the bitterness that, that makes it hard to love, I get it. It's hard to love someone that you disagree with, right? But we cannot, I want you to hear this, we cannot put love on hold. We cannot put love on hold. Love is not something to get complacent about. We cannot simply just stop loving others. For example, like, oh, I loved my girlfriend last week, I did something nice for her, or like, I love my friend the other month. I love, I love my family, yeah, right? We can't become satisfied with how we've already loved. That's not how love works, right? That's not how a relationship or a marriage or a friendship works. It doesn't, it doesn't say like, well, I loved you last week. What are you talking about? I don't love you, like, right? And I think like we need to realize that love is an urgent matter. This world right now, it desperately, desperately, desperately needs the love of Christ to combat the brokenness and the division that is taking over our world, that's taking over our country, our city. And I would go as far as to say, like, it's taking over our university, this division, this brokenness, right? Love is an urgent matter. And Peter also explains, like, we need to be good stewards of the gifts that God has given us. Right? This, is, this is what we replace that complacency with, by actively using the gifts that God has given us. And like, when we have giftings, like, more often than not, we don't put them on hold. Right? Like LeBron didn't put it on hold, like training for the NBA. He's in his 17th season. He's still not putting it on hold. He's still grinding. He's still getting better. Right? He just won a championship. 
we don't put our gifts on hold, right? These athletes, even musicians, like, you guys don't put your gifts on hold. You don't become complacent in your craft because then you're going to get rusty. You're going to struggle to get back to where you were. And it's the same thing with our spiritual gifts. We have to put them to practice. We need to grow them, to perfect them so that we might further the kingdom of God. But we need to remember that God, God is with us. Don't worry, he's providing for us. He's helping us to perfect our gifts. But we gotta be willing to go through the fire. We as a church community, as believers, we gotta be willing to go through the storm, to go through that suffering, to suffer for Christ, to suffer for what is righteous. And let me tell you, like, that cannot wait. I can't wait. So why aren't we starting? We gotta start now. And I know, like, like I mentioned earlier, like we, we all know, we all understand what it's like to get off track sometimes. It has happened. It's happened to me, right? Maybe it's happening right now for you. Maybe you're in that pit right now. And maybe it's going to happen soon. I can guarantee you it's going to happen soon. It's going to happen at some point where you're, where you're tempted and you struggle to stay on track. But if we don't pay, like, pay more attention and actually physically guard ourselves, we're going to get off track, <laughs> And we as Christ followers, we don't want to sit idly by while our spiritual life falls apart, while our church communities fall apart, right? Getting off track, it just simply does not lead to life. It does not lead to fulfillment. I know that it seems in the moment like, oh, I'll take this break, like it'll be fine. Like maybe, maybe if I just take a break from God, <laughs> I'll be regenerated, re-energized, refueled. But no, that's not how it works. <laughs> that doesn't lead to fulfillment. But I think complacency and apathy, they, they only bring us farther from God and farther from who he made us to be. We don't want to end up in that place asking ourselves, how did I get here? Why am I in this place? What happened? What happened, right? And I know that some of you are in that place right now. And I get that. I've been there. That's why I want to encourage you that it's okay to be there because there's hope. There is grace. And like Peter's saying, we have the opportunity to begin making daily decisions to suffer for Christ, to suffer for what is right, to prepare ourselves, to ready ourselves, and also to live with a sense of urgency so that, so that we as individuals may become stronger, but also that we would become stronger as a church community. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we are just so thankful. We're so blessed. We're so blessed to be here. God, you've given us so much, and we don't want to take that for granted. God, we thank you for these words that, that you have given us uh, through Peter, that I know that we've, we've, we've struggled with sin, but we're, we're past that. We've made a break with that life. But God, don't, we don't want to become complacent or too satisfied. We don't want to become apathetic or uncaring. But God, we want to be people that are willing to suffer for you, to suffer for, for what is right. And we thank you that you understand that. God, we're not alone in our suffering. You show us what it's like to suffer, and you give us a community of believers that are suffering right alongside us, and we thank you for that. And God, I pray that you would help us to live with a sense of urgency because these matters cannot wait. They cannot wait. And so God, go before us today, tomorrow, this week, this month, this year. Go before us. Help us to be willing to suffer and willing to live with a sense of urgency. God, we just love you and we thank you so much for all that you are and all that you're doing and all that you're gonna do. We ask this all in your name. Amen. Thank you guys.